Aloha. I'm Kim Hauf, the Minister of Discipleship and Community Engagement here at the First UMC of Honolulu, and I welcome you to the Brit Lectures the first in-person lectures in three years. We hope that you will have a meaningful time this evening and our worship will be blessed by the leadership of Christ UMC this evening and we thank them. Now, if you are clergy and you wish to have continuing education credit, please see Winnie Ching. Winnie, can you raise your hand? Everybody see her? So remember, you have to see her so that you can get credit for being here this evening for CPEs. Our ushers for this evening are Leanne and Steve Nagano of IAEA UMC, and we thank them. They have the bulletins and also the slips of paper for questions for our Q&A session, which will follow our reception after the conclusion of this evening's lecture. So it's lecture, reception, and then Q&A. But be sure to put your slips in the calabash bowl that you see up here at the front so that we can sort through those for the Q&A section. We are grateful to our first UMC host and all who contributed goodies for the reception. And now please rise in body and spirit for the singing of our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Please be seated and join me in the evening prayer. May God be with you. Let us pray. We praise and thank you, O God, for you are without beginning and without end. Through Christ you created the whole world. Through Christ you preserve it. You made the day for the works of light and the night for the refreshment of our minds and bodies. Keep us now in Christ. Grant us a peaceful evening, a night filled with grace and wisdom. Through Christ and in the Holy Spirit, we offer you all glory, honor, and worship now and forever.
14. So I'll be reading from the New International Version. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore by the disciples, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. 
The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Prior to introducing our guest lecturer this evening, I would like to take a moment to extend my sincerest appreciation to Dr. Matthew Britt and his spouse, Dr. Carla Britt, for gracing us with their presence this weekend. The Hawaii District is deeply grateful for the immense love and unwavering support you and your family have continuously demonstrated. This evening, as we are now back at the First Church, we especially remember the remarkable legacy of your parents and their invaluable contribution to the creation and sustainability of the Brit Lecture Series. Welcome, Dr. Brits. Now, as the Hawaii District Superintendent, I have both the pleasure and the honor to extend the invitations to esteemed speakers to be the guest Brit lecturers for our beloved community. While I'm currently in my third year of serving in this capacity, this is my very first in-person Brit lecture during my tenure. Given the significance of this occasion, I did not hesitate to extend an invitation to Reverend Eugene Cho to be our 43rd Brit lecturer. You see, Reverend Cho is a truly exceptional leader whose work in fighting poverty, hunger, and social injustice has inspired and motivated people across the world. As the president of Bread for the World and the founder of One Day's Wages, he brings a wealth of knowledge and experience in advocating for change and building a more just and equitable society. His dedication and passion for empowering people to make a positive difference in the world, make him a true beacon of hope and a source of inspiration. We are honored to have Reverend Cho as our guest lecturer and his spouse, Minnie Cho, who are unable to join us this evening, but with us in spirit this year. And now we look forward to hearing Reverend Cho's powerful message of faith, compassion, and action. And as a result of this weekend and our time together, may we live out the conference vision to end spiritual and physical hunger. Friends, please join me in welcoming Reverend Eugene Cho to the pulpit. turn on my mic. I don't think I turned it on, so give me one second. All right. I am going to, can I just hand this back to you?
All right. Well, again, thank you so much for the honor of this invitation. And uh, I feel like it would be uh, important for me just to take a moment to, to thank all of the committee members uh, who worked on this, uh, Reverend Lee, for your leadership. I'm assuming uh, I wouldn't be here if you didn't green light the invitation. So thank you uh, to both Dr. Britz. Thank you so much for your ongoing commitment to this lecture as well. Um, I am, this is a, a, a very special occasion in the sense that I, I rarely have the opportunity uh, to speak at a place for several consecutive days. Uh, I usually, uh, just because of, of time and schedules, I come in and usually um, have to depart after one or two talks at most. And so uh, this is very uh, different. Uh, and in many ways, I think it allows me to uh, get to hear stories uh, directly from you. And I look forward to doing that over the next few days, but also uh, to share a little bit of my story with you as well. And so before I get into my talk, my lecture for tonight, uh, I thought I would just share a little bit about my story so that you're not listening to an absolute stranger over the next uh, four days uh, beyond the embellished introduction uh, that Reverend Lee gave you. Uh, after hearing her lecture, I was feeling like, gosh, I feel like a six foot eight basketball player. It was uh, so overly generous. So again, my name is Eugene and I was born in Seoul, South Korea. I immigrated to this uh, country when I was six years old. Um, I am now 52 years old, praise God, for Asian genes. Anyone? Asian genes? And uh, my wife and I, we have uh, three uh, mostly grown children, a 20-year-old, a 22-year-old, and a 24-year-old. And um, before I share about my family, um, I. I I always feel compelled to share the story of my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents. My great-grandfather was one of the first people in his small little village outside of a city called Pyongyang. Uh, Pyongyang is now the capital city of North Korea. So my father was born in that village. And my father is 87 years old, and it's strange because if you were to ask him, uh, where were you born, his response uh, accurately would be Korea. And if you said, naturally speaking, north or south, it would take him about 10 seconds to figure out what you're trying to ask him. Because growing up, there was only one Korea, eventually split up by the travesty of a war. But my great-grandfather was one of the first people to say yes to Jesus because uh, there were these uh, crazy Protestant missionaries, Presbyterians, Methodists, who set sail across the waters when travel was not quite that easy back then. And they were so moved and gripped by the gospel of Jesus truly believing that Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, compelled by the commandment to not just go to Jerusalem or Judea, to Samaria, but literally to the ends of the earth. And my great-grandfather was one of the first people to say yes to Jesus. He was so captivated by the gospel that he would then uh, go to home and share the news about Jesus with my great-grandmother, and she also chose to say yes to Jesus. And our whole household came to faith. Now, they experienced persecution. They experienced unfathomable poverty. Uh, my father, when he was 84 years old, told me for the very first time that he had spent some months in a refugee camp, separated from some of his family growing up. Stories about pulling out grass from the ground to eat it during the war because they were so, so hungry. But one of the amazing things about the stories that they would tell me is that they kept sharing that along different places of their plight and journey, they kept encountering Christ followers. And Christ followers 
not only would they tell them about Jesus, but showed them about Jesus. And, and I'm not suggesting that Christianity in Korea is perfect, far from it, but when you study and dig, one of the reasons why I personally became a follower of Jesus at the age of 18 is as a emerging adult, I began to study more about my parents and grandparents' story and about the story of the missions movement in Korea. And I was amazed that some of these early missionaries, so moved by the gospel, along with indigenous leaders, they helped build the first hospitals. Because of circumstances, they helped build orphanages. They were on the streets protesting against, at that time, the occupation of Japan. And the list goes on and on. There's something powerful about the gospel, believed in both word and in deed. And I'm grateful for that because I think the reason why I'm here, again, so moved by the honor and the, uh, of this invitation is, because I truly believe no one is an island to themselves. And sometimes people argue with me, but I, I truly believe there is no such thing as a self-made person. Someone encouraged you. Someone believed in you. Someone prayed for you. Someone mentored you. Someone discipled you. Someone fasted for you. I'm not suggesting that your lives or my life was perfect by any means, but I am suggesting that somehow there was individuals, community people, churches that somehow encouraged you towards the way. So I'm not sure who some of those missionaries were back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I know their names, the Underwoods, the Moffats, but as I look back, I'm always reminded about that embodiment of God's grace. And I share that with you on the first night of our series of our lectures because I hope that you understand that as lay leaders, as pastors, as leaders in your churches, I pray that uh, you would not only be encouraged throughout this lectures, but that you would encourage the encouragers so that they would encourage the flock and the church so that we might continue to bring glory unto Christ. So I immigrated to this country, as I shared earlier, when I was six years old. And uh, maybe when the time is right, I'll share a bit more about that immigration story. It was hard and challenging. I'm the only one that I know that flunked first grade here in the U.S., um, but eventually, I became a follower at 18 of Jesus Christ, and then I went back to Korea to pastor at a church in Korea. And that was a, 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 an enlightening, amazing experience. Learned to uh, reappreciate my culture and my language, and so my Korean isn't that great, but began to relearn my language, and then I, I met my wife in Korea. She went to a different church, but she served at a company that my senior pastor had started. And so we met at a church called Onuri Gyoe in Seoul, Korea. And uh, my wife and I, uh, we are here because, uh, yes, the honor of this invitation, but it also happens to be our 26th anniversary. We were going to come to Hawaii last year for our 25th in February, but this thing called the pandemic was still looming large and still is something that we should be mindful about. And so we had to cancel that trip. I was so upset. And so uh, we felt like, wow, what, what a gift from God to be able to come here, to be able to do a series of talks, to enjoy this beautiful sunny weather throughout this week. No, I'm not bitter. Oh, this is exactly like Seattle weather, which is home for us. Exactly. <laughs> You made me feel way too much like home this week. <laughs> and um, I'll share a picture of uh, my wife and I when we first met. So this is a picture of my wife and I when we first met. Um, this is us. Uh, they used to call me 
the Korean John the Baptist. Uh, as you can tell, uh, my friends would joke, Beauty and the Beast, don't judge who is who. Uh, and below are our uh, traditional uh, photos on the right, Korean wardrobe, and then of course our Western. And so we got married February 1st, uh, 26 years ago. My wife is here with me, I think uh, D.S. Lee mentioned it. She got ill today, and so she's home resting. Hopefully she'll be back tomorrow. And then um, my wife and I, uh, we don't want to sound boastful, but uh, we also were in a movie together uh, many years ago. Uh, we'll show this. This is a picture of my wife and I. Um, I don't know if you've seen Crazy Rich Asians. It's a spoof. I hope that made sense. Um, uh, the folks at my church made this as a Photoshop. I don't know why my, my hands are so large. But anyways, that's... Uh, uh, a photo of my wife and I growing in love and um, as we shared earlier we're parents to three mostly grown kids and here's the most recent photo of our, our family and I. Um, our, our eldest is on my, on my left, that's Jubilee. Uh, my second daughter is Trinity <laughs> who we just found out is on the island this week um, and so hopefully she might stop by the lectures as well. And then my son, my youngest, um, his name is Jedi. Um, I, I think it would be appropriate um, if I can just spend some time uh, introducing why our kids are named the way that they are. Uh, because in many ways, if you understand our kids' names, you're going to have an understanding from how in which I'm trying to approach these lectures. So our children have both biblical names, but with pop culture references. Uh, because in many ways, I truly believe that we wanted our children to be light and salt, not just to the church, but to the world. And so we wanted them to know that their names are rooted in God's word, but we also wanted them to have interesting conversations with uh, others. So for example, uh, our eldest, her name is Jubilee, and you might not know this, but uh, Jubilee is in the Old Testament where every 50 year God calls um, restoration of the land to ease, to erase debt every 50 years. It's powerful and beautiful. Uh, Jubilee also happens to be an X-Men character. Uh, wrong crowd, okay. Um, our second daughter, her name is Trinity. A trinity, God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, and uh, I, I'm not condoning showing kids this film when they're young, but Trinity happens to be a character in a, a trilogy of films called The Matrix, which I, I think is really provocative and interesting. And then our son, his name is Jedi. Um, and Jedi comes from Solomon's Hebrew name, Jedediah, which means the chosen one or chosen beloved. And there are auto, uh, biographies written about George Lucas where he talks about how his worldview was influenced by his Judeo-Christian background. And so people are not surprised to see themes in some of his writings, including the Star Wars, kind of around the theme of the Star Wars theme. And so um, uh, we named our son Jedediah, Jedi for short. And usually when I'm speaking at, at conferences and I share this, uh, I, I'm often speaking to college students or young adults. And when I share this story, inevitably, um, like a group of young men storm the stage after my sermon. And they storm the stage and they'll say, uh, Pastor Eugene, uh, how did you convince your wife to name your son Jedi? <laughs> uh, for the sake of a couple of our younger folks that might be new parents to be or that are single, let me just share some words of wisdom here. Uh, when we found out we were having a son, our 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 seche, our, our, magne, our, our third, we, we, I went to my wife and I said, Minhi, I love you. Uh, that's not the trick. I said, Minhi, I love you. I would like to name our son Jedi. 
And she looked at me and she said, no. <laughs> and this was actually a pretty big deal because names are important. There's reasons why you name your children uh, their particular names. And uh, we actually fought about this because I so desperately wanted to name our son Jedediah. In fact, being a true Star Wars fan, uh, you might not believe me, but being a true Star Wars fan, I went to my wife and I said, we will name our son Jedi. <laughs> um, she said, no. <laughs> oh, when you meet her tomorrow night, she, she'll crack you up. Uh, and so for eight months, or you know, five or six months or so upon finding out, I was trying to figure out how do I go about trying to convince my wife. So on the eighth month, I finally went to my wife and I said, Minhi, um, I, I love you so much. And I said, you know, I've been thinking about this, praying about this, and I realized that um, I was wrong. Um, it's only fair, only right, only just you. You're the one carrying this baby in your womb. It's only fair that you should choose our son's name. She was so happy. So I then said, here's your choice. <laughs> it's Jedi or Frodo, one of these two. <laughs> you choose. I am so grateful that she chose Jedi. Because I don't know about you, but Frodo Cho, you see, you would have been bullies. Uh, Frodo Cho doesn't sound right. Um, and so I, I am, again, just so grateful to be here with you. And um, I know we read our scripture passages, and because this is our first night, and we've got three nights together, and then a Monday series, I, I, I'd like to give you a road map of, I, of, of, of uh, how we'll navigate the next few days. And I do hope that you'll come back. Uh, I hope that you'll be encouraged to invite others to come join you, perhaps those within your churches or ministries. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about what leadership looks like in challenging times. And right now, uh, maybe even for my own sake, I've had the opportunity to just share a little bit about our life stories, share some funny stories. Uh, but all kidding aside, I really do believe that these are challenging times in our world, in our nation, in your state, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our churches. And as a result, these are challenging times for pastors and leaders, ministers, deacons, elders, bishops, superintendents, parents, and the list goes on. And not to suggest that I have all of the answers, but like you, I am seeking God's wisdom, the Spirit's wisdom about what it means to lead faithfully during these challenging times. So today, tomorrow, and the night after that, we'll share a bit about this. And then on, the, on Monday morning, I want to speak to you more specifically about the dangers of the idolatry of politics. And the reason why I'm doing it, not, it's not because I'm trying to give a political talk, but it's based upon a book that I wrote a couple years ago. Uh, but I truly believe, based on research that the Barna Report has conducted, that the number two reason why leaders in the church are leaving is because of the intense polarization that's infecting our churches as well. And then I want to share with you on Monday about what that looks like at Bread for the World. Uh, I spend the majority of my time in D.C. Uh, engaging the White House, the administration, members of Congress, and what does it look like for us to be citizens, followers of Jesus, but citizens of this nation and trying to be light and salt. And so that kind of gives you a, a roadmap of how we'll spend the next few days together. So now, could you just join me again once more in a word of prayer and we'll get started. God, we thank you again so much for the opportunity to be together. 
we ask for your Holy Spirit. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. And all God's people said, Amen. John 21, as you know, is the last chapter in the Gospel of John. I don't know about you, but I, I suspect that there are stories, uh, Bible verses that are among your favorites. Uh, I have my list. But one of them that I keep coming back to again and again is John chapter 21. In, in fact, I, I think this story might be among some of my all-time favorite stories in the scriptures. Not just in the gospels, but in the entirety of the scriptures. In fact, it's a story that I have probably read more than any other Bible verse in the Bible. And it's not just for the sake of teaching. I read this chapter for me, for myself, for my heart, my soul, on a regular basis, and nearly every time I read it, I find that there's something new that I'm gleaning from this passage. Now, there's probably two reasons why I am drawn to this story. Uh, the first reason, I'll just be honest, is a little fleshly, it's very human, and it's I love the outdoors. I love all things about the outdoors. I love uh, hiking, I am a wannabe hunter in my mind, and I also love fishing. And every time there's a fishing story in the Bible, I am just putting myself in the midst of that story, trying to capture and imagine the scene. Now, I'm just curious, anyone here enjoy uh, fishing? Just raise your hand if you enjoy fishing. Just a couple of you here, not many. Anyone here enjoy eating fish? Raise your hand. See, a lot of lazy people here. Um, so uh, I love fishing because it's the one thing that my father and I did growing up together. And we remember this. And then in the pandemic, um, it was something that was a balm to my soul. In fact, I, I want to share with you a picture of a couple of fish that I recently caught. I'm a big bass fisherman. Right? I'm trying to get your superintendent to sponsor my career someday as a professional fisherman. And some of you might be looking at this photo and you're asking yourself, what's the, the, the purpose of showing these photos for this lecture? There is no purpose. Fishermen love boasting about their photos. That's the whole point. So uh, we can move on. But that's one of the reasons why I'm so drawn to this story. It's a fishing story. And so as I'm reading it, I'm trying to picture the scene, the climate, their methodology, their techniques, and the list goes on. But the second reason why I love this story, and this is the essence of our lecture tonight, is that I want you to know that it's not just merely a fishing story. It's not just merely a story of Jesus' followers, Jesus' disciples who were bored or who had nothing else to do. And therefore, one day Peter just says, you know what, I'm going fishing and the rest follow. In fact, scholars, pastors, Maybe not all, but many who have studied and exegeted this passage, they believe that what this really is, in essence, is underneath the layer of what you might initially read. It is an incredibly raw, vulnerable story about doubt, confusion, chaos, leadership struggles, and ultimately a story about God's grace. And that's why I have to keep coming back to this story. Any leader that says that they don't struggle with doubt or confusion or about leadership, I think struggle with something called lying. 
I was having lunch with Dr. Britz, your superintendent, and a couple other guests, and I was commenting that as I reflect back upon years ago going to seminary and going to conferences and reading books, I feel like the toolbox that I had that I used for ministry for many, many years, I look at that toolbox and some of the stuff feels really archaic, edges, dull. You see, Peter, being the vocal leader that he is, the vociferous one, Peter says what? His scripture tells us, he says these three words, I'm going fishing. And as you study this, in essence, what Peter is saying underneath those words is I'm done. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm unsure. He's saying, I'm going back to what I was doing before I met Jesus. I mean, you recall even the Israelites in the Old Testament freed and liberated by God's prophetic word through his servant Moses, even the Israelites, upon leaving the bondage of slavery, some of them say, we want to go back. And so Peter and others, when they say, I'm going fishing, he's in essence saying, I'm weary, I'm heavy burdened, there's too much conflict, too much challenge, too much confusion, this is too complicated, this is too messy. I wonder if Peter may have said these words that I have lifted up in my mind several times over the past few years. It goes like this. God, this isn't what I signed up for. I don't need a show of hands, but have there been times that those words have echoed in your mind? This leadership, this situation, this relationship, this friendship, this marriage, this leadership, this church, this scenario, this is not what I signed up for. Every single one of us will talk about this. As human beings, to be human is to plan. And whether you articulate it or not, whether you have an Excel sheet or not, all of us in our mind, we have an idea what things should look like. And I can just imagine Peter saying, this is not what I signed up for. And some of you might be wondering, well, explain why Peter and others may have felt this way. I think it's because Peter, having walked with Jesus for three years, he walked with Jesus. Jesus, having been crucified, they were crushed and crestfallen by what they experienced and saw, and then they experienced the euphoria of the resurrection. And then Jesus begins to give them commandments and convictions in their heart. Go and make disciples of all nations, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, and I can imagine the disciples, including Peter, having a mountaintop experience. We've had some of those in our own lives. And so I can imagine them being so pumped up, so excited by this mountaintop spiritual, intimate moments with Jesus experience, and then Jesus disappears. And then he reappears. And then he disappears. And then he reappears. In fact, John tells us that this here is the third time in which Jesus reveals himself to a group of seven disciples in this story. My point to you is this. They receive a vision and a commandment from Jesus. And now I can imagine Peter basically saying, how do we do this? Have you ever received a prompting from the Holy Spirit? Have you ever received a, a vision from God? And it is such a, a beautiful, intimate, tender moment for me. Not many, but I've had a few moments in my life where I've experienced 
the incredible intimacy of the Holy Spirit. Like I believe that God spoke to me. As weird as it sounds, over my years as a, as, a, as a Christian, there's been a couple moments where I've experienced a vision and a word from God, and I'm like so excited, and every single time there's a moment where I say, I don't know how to do this. And then you begin to say, this is not what I signed up for. And so Peter and the disciples, and I'm adding all of this sound as part of my sermon. <laughs> I mean, friends, think about this. It has been a challenging time. Uh, did you know that, for example, statistically, they say that one out of every three practicing Christians have stopped coming to church. One out of every three. Now time will tell in the next 12 to 18 months if they'll ever come back. But even beyond that, I'm shocked and concerned that according to the latest Barna research report, 38% of pastors and leaders in the church have contemplated seriously quitting their ministries. 38. Friends, don't be hypothetical. Look around right here. It's basically everyone on this line to this side, you're contemplating quitting. That research goes to show that actually, for those who are under 45 years old, that percentage spikes up to 46%. In essence, one out of every two youngish leader is contemplating resigning from leadership. So I can only safely assume that there are leaders here who've contemplated, man, this is not what I signed up for. I need an exit strategy. Because that's been on my mind. And part of it is because, let's just name for a moment some of the intensity, and not to say that I know the context of ministry in Hawaii because I don't, and so this is kind of a general assessment, but friends, just for a moment, think about what we've experienced over the last three years. I cannot tell you the number of times I've heard someone, like one of your pastors coming up here and saying, welcome to our first in-person gathering in three years. And everyone nervously clapping. Gosh, that's the most overused line that I've heard, but I've heard it every single time over the last year. And it's still happening. Think about what we've experienced as a community of people. A pandemic, an unprecedented pandemic. Illnesses and deaths. I had an uncle pass away. Never imagined attending a Zoom funeral. The economic impact and joblessnesses, businesses lost. The arguments and debates left and right about masks and vaccines and boosters. Don't raise your hand, let's not fight. I don't know what it's been like here, but we've just experienced just a couple of years ago, the most contentious election cycle in modern American history. We experienced the insurrection of January 6th. Uh, my office is literally a quarter mile from the Capitol building. You could see everything happen. We've seen 
Social unrest and protests spiked throughout the world, including our country. We've seen and have to acknowledge the pain and trauma on our black and brown sisters and brothers, names that will forever be etched in our memory as they should. George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. But we've also seen, I believe at times, this sweeping vilification of all law enforcement. We've seen the rise of anti-Asian rhetoric and violence. Maybe not here in Hawaii, I don't know. But in the States, I had the most painful argument with my father about two years ago. My father, then 86, comes to me one day and says, Yujuna, my name in Korean. He says, Eugene, I need to buy a gun. I'm like shocked. Yeah? 총을 사고 싶다고요? You want to buy a gun? My father, 87, he makes me so nervous, still driving. I hope he's not watching this. I love you. But if you watch my father, his hands are always shaking. He's doing well, hanging in there, walks three miles every day. But a couple years ago, he says, I I need to buy a gun. So I say, why? And there's something about watching the news too much. Not to say that his feelings and fear was unwarranted, but when you see image after image of Asian elderly being pushed and beaten or hurt, and so he says the most painful thing to me, he says, I need to protect your mother. And you might not know this, but gun purchases among Asian American population in the last two years unprecedented because of fear. And so, yes, the last few years, the the tension, the rise of anti-Asian rhetoric or hate. Of course, strained relationships as a result of all of these things and so much more among families, among marriages, among churches, among neighbors. I know Hawaii is paradise, but I've got to assume there's been some strain and tension here as well. And of course, there's conflicts around the world. The war in Ukraine, what's transpired in Afghanistan, where as a result, they're now estimating that potentially 90% of children under five could die because of hunger. Conflicts in Tigray, in Ethiopia, Yemen, South Sudan, Myanmar, shootings in our nation in Buffalo, Uvalde this past week at Michigan State. Hey, thanks for coming to this year's Brit Lectures. We'll see you next year. Friends, can you imagine if that literally was the end of the Brit Lectures? I I fear that our distinguished guests, doctors, Brits, would probably send a note to the superintendent saying, never invite that person back. Why? Because if we simply end on a litany of what we see and not a word of hope, Uh, We need a word of hope. So friends, from our passage here, if I can, and, and there's so much that I can share, and remember, I haven't even talked about personal events that have gone on in people's lives. Like I just shared with you communal things, I suspect that if you're like me, there have been some difficult, challenging things going on in your own lives. 
and you're asking yourself, this is not what I signed up for. I want to go back to what I was doing before I felt called into lay leadership or into ministry. So friends, from our passage today, there's five things uh, that I'm hoping might encourage you on a practical level. I know you've had lecturers in the past with their academic brilliance will wow you with their intellectual prowess. I want to try to be as practical as I can. So five things that we can learn from our passage that as leaders, I pray would encourage you, but also might be helpful as you encourage your flock. Here's the first thing. And I truly believe the first thing that I want to share with you, it is the most important truth that you must not forget as a follower of Jesus and as a leader. The first thing that we can learn from this passage, three words, I'm going to pause for dramatic effect, three words, the most important thing, here it is, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Years ago, when I really began studying this passage, I was doing word exegesis, and I was studying the, uh, the, the, the significance, the theological significance of the specific number of fish that John names. There's some really interesting things, and as I was studying all of these details, all really sharp and interesting, I glossed over the fact that Jesus Christ... A real physical human being, born in Nazareth, and at the age of 30, on God's Kairos time, emerges into public ministry and begins to preach about the kingdom of God. He prophesies that he will be killed, and this man is killed in the most horrific way. And just as he says, he says, on the third day, the power of God will raise me up again. And it's very possible that even as leaders, we sometimes reduce the gospel of Christ, the good news that Jesus is risen, simply to Resurrection Easter Sunday. I know it's not Resurrection Easter Sunday or Holy Week this week, but I want you to know, you must know, we need to know, it's the only thing that will give us a sense of steadfastness in a chaotic time, it's this truth that Jesus is who he says he is and Jesus will accomplish what he says he will accomplish. In other words, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is alive. Our reading here tells us that it's the third time Jesus appears. Jesus, throughout the gospel scriptures, there are 12 instances in which the risen Christ is revealed and shown to different groups of people. Jorgen Moltmann, the author of an incredible book called Theology of Hope, he simply says, quote, our faith rises and falls on the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, also simply says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is our faith. Oh, we can debate theology left and right. We can talk about many cultural things. I just want you to know that what gives us power as leaders in the church is not just our degrees, our credibility. It's the fact that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. Friends, if Christ is not risen, another way to translate this, if Christ is not risen, then everything that you and I do is a lie. It's a sham. The Brit lectures, respectfully, it's a hoax. Your ministry, it's a hoax. This church building is a hoax. And if it's a show, 
And what do you think will happen when it's a show? Well, let's try to put on the best show that we can. Get nice piano, nice musicians, an angry Asian preacher from the U.S., Nice technology, this iPad streaming, make me look tall. I love this angle. Jesus is alive. Friends, I was listening, and and I'm not recommending this because it was something that was hard to watch. A few years ago, a Nigerian pastor by the name of Pastor Lawan Andimi was captured by the Boko Haram terrorist group in Nigeria. Without watching the video, I would encourage you just to study his story. But the Boko Haram basically captured this pastor and they... beheaded him live on the internet. And they were trying to use Pastor Andimi to perpetuate fear. And Pastor Andimi, in his native language, he begins to speak and he shares about his love for his family, his children. And then he gives a word for the church. He says, fear not. Jesus is alive. I share that not because I'm trying to say that that should be a cop-out answer for all things. It's to diminish whatever we're encountering in our lives or in our culture. I am simply saying that I truly believe amid all the challenges, God is. is still in control. That the Holy Spirit is still on the move. And that's the first thing. Jesus is alive. I know we're all Methodists here, but it's also okay to be a Pentecostal Methodist as well. You can also say amen as well. Here's the second thing that we can learn from this story, and it's a word that I would just simply say clarity. And what I mean by clarity is that the disciples, as well as you and I, they need to release our human obsession with clarity. See, in essence, I believe that this is the reason why Peter and others said we're done. Because there's something about our human nature, whatever your leadership style might be, whatever your personality test might be, whether you're an extrovert or introvert, whatever your enneagram might be, all of those things, which drives me nuts. But to be human means that we want to be in control. Uh, Isn't that in essence what the last three, four years have taught us? Uh, Because we felt like our control has been stripped away from us as a result of the pandemic and all the debates around many layers. You see, Peter and others, they were given instructions by Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations, but Jesus doesn't give clarity. In other words, friends, I want you to know That despite our human obsession to be in control, God doesn't always reveal the specifics of our future because clarity is not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus saves and the good news, Jesus is with you. If your Bible says that Jesus promises you absolute clarity and specifics, of your life, let's switch Bibles. 
because my Bible doesn't say this. Uh, let me give you an example. I became a follower at the age of 18, as I shared earlier, and as I look back at my life, 52-year-old Eugene, looking back at 18-year-old Eugene, many, many years ago, don't do the math, but 52-year-old Eugene, looking back, when I became a follower of Christ, uh, my older sisters and brothers in Christ, it wasn't necessarily bad discipleship, but I misinterpreted what they were teaching me. Uh, I thought what I heard or wanted to hear is that if I prayed, God would show me specific clarity over my life. And so I would pray as an 18-year-old Eugene, God, show me the specific details about my future. Show me specific details about what major, God, show me what my career, what exactly my job will be. God, would you show me what neighborhood, what city I will live in and my most passionate prayer is God show me who I'll marry God show me who I'll marry and as I look back now I am so grateful that God did not reveal to 18 year old Eugene that I would devastate my parents uh, my parents had ordained my brothers and my life. They weren't able to go to school, and so they were obsessed by education. My oldest brother was supposed to be an engineer, so he became an engineer, got his master's, got his PhD, got his MBA, got his postdoctorate, and I hate him. And I hope he's watching this. <laughs> uh, my Cha Gunyong, my second brother, was supposed to be a business person or a lawyer. And so he goes to UCLA and gets his business degree and goes to Wall Street. And I was supposed to be a, a doctor. And so in my third year in college, I remember calling my parents. Uh, Eugene입니다. Mom and dad, hello, it's your son Eugene. Uh, for some of you young people, uh, this is a phone. I, I don't know if you're like confused. <laughs> you're like wondering, what is he doing? This is an old school phone. You remember the old school phone? You dial. And so I said, I have decided what I want to become. I'll never forget this conversation. My mom says, Doctor. I go, uh, I, I, Engineer. Uh, I don't Lawyer. Um, and then she says, No, what do you want to what do you want to become? I still remember with all of my courage, uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, uh, 어머니, 저, 아버지, 저, um, 목사 되고 싶습니다. I, I want to be a pastor. Hello? All I heard for the next five minutes. Man, it was painful. Um, they disowned me for two years. Two years. Had God told 18-year-old Eugene that I, I would meet and marry my wife, who I dearly love, and love our children, and uh, one of our kids would have a, a lifelong chronic illness. 
And we're not talking about medical visits like once a week or once a month, but for years, trying to get her the best medical attention. Had God told a i g h Had God told 18-year-old Eugene that as a uh, 31-year-old church planter, uh, I would go through a season of unemployment and finally land a job as, and this is not because this job is beneath me, it was not on my Excel sheet, but I would be working as a custodian at a Barnes and Noble store. When I look back, I am so grateful that God did not reveal those specific details because I know exactly how 18-year-old Eugene would have reacted. I would have run the other way. Do you know why God doesn't reveal specific details for your life? It's because of God's grace. God loves you. So part of what it means to be a leader as we do continuing education and read and study is yes, let's make sure we equip ourselves with tools and latest trends and all of these things have value and place, but never, never mistake that God promises you clarity. He says, have faith. Matthew 28, verse 20, he promises that he will be with you always. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Here's the third thing that we can learn from our passage. And I'm going to kind of speed through because I think I'm kind of also rushing through time here. The third thing that we can learn from our passage here is something called God's voice. And I know what you're thinking. Of course, we know this. Your leaders in the church, your ministers and deacons and elders, your experts in your church. But sometimes the most important things are the things that we take for granted because we know it to be true. Like if I were to tell you how many of us believe scriptures is important, of course all of us would say yes, but you'd be shocked at research that shows about the number of pastors who only read the Bible to prepare sermons. It is shocking. See, what this story shares and teaches us is that at a distance, Jesus asks the question, friends, haven't you any fish? Which I want you to know The disciples have no idea that it's Jesus. I want you to know that it's a ridiculous question for a couple reasons. One, it's the most annoying question to ask a fisherman if they've caught any fish if they haven't caught any fish. But it's ridiculous because you need to know that when Jesus asks questions in the Gospels, it's never for his benefit. Does that make sense? So let me explain this. When Jesus asks, friends, haven't you any fish, you think Jesus didn't know? If Jesus were here, he would not ask you the question, how do I get to so-and-so? Unless he's trying to teach you a lesson. You see, Jesus is all-knowing. He knows everything. And so when Jesus says, friends, Haven't you any fish? We have to understand he's trying to teach a lesson and we can't learn unless we listen. Uh, Let me give you another example if I'm losing you. There's a story in the Gospel of Luke of a woman who's suffering from internal bleeding, which means back then she was considered dirty and unclean. And in her mind, she's thinking to herself, if only I can touch Jesus, I will be healed. She's working, worming through the crowd, finally touches Jesus. By the power of God, she's healed. And then Jesus asks a ridiculous question. Jesus says what? Who touched me? No, seriously, you think Jesus didn't know? 
Uh, you think Jesus is like, ah! I'm a perfect introvert who touched me. Or did Jesus in that moment ask that question because he wanted this woman to know, he wanted everyone in this crowd to know, especially men in a patriarchal culture where women were seen as possessions based upon what they brought in as a result of their bodies, that when Jesus says, who touched me, Jesus wanted this woman to know, in essence, I see you. I see you. So what is Jesus trying to teach? Jesus is trying to teach Peter and the disciples, friends, haven't you any fish? Why is this question so provocative? Because you need to know that Peter, along with several other of the disciples that were present, they were professional fishermen. While they may not have been wealthy, we ought to respect that they had their own small businesses and made a living being fishermen, anglers. I can tell you, I am absolutely confident that they have fished the Sea of Galilee thousands upon thousands of times. They knew the best methods, the best techniques, the best times, the best everything. We don't have time to go into this, but um, uh, if you and I were talking about bass fishing, like for, uh, I, I have a five, six rod. I have a six foot rod. I have a six, six rod. I have a seven foot six rod, and I have eight to 10 feet rods occasionally when I'm fishing for salmon or steelhead. I have spin casters, I have bait casters. I have lures specifically designed to go 12 to 18 feet under the surface of the water when the water or the weather is hot and the fish are deeper. I have eight to 10 feet crank, I have two to four feet crank. I have lots of different lures, including plastic worms used for Ned rigs and Texas rigs, and I have uh, Carolina rigs and wacky rigs. My point to you humbly is I'm a better fisherman than you. <laughs> Why? Because I fish hundreds of times. So I know there are a couple places, a couple lakes that I go to. Man, I know that lake so well. I know where there's wood. I know when there's grass in the bottom. I know where there's places I have to avoid or I have to use weedless uh, setup. This is way too much information, I know. But my point is, these disciples were experts. What I'm trying to tell you is, do you know you're an expert? We're all experts. Especially when the DS shared my resume, I was like, wow, I'm an expert. Woo! I'm going to have to take that and read it to my wife tonight. <laughs> but what happens is that if we're not careful, we end up thinking it's about our credibility, our background, our degrees, our styles, our techniques, our connections, our resources, and we stop trusting and leaning on the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Friends, this sounds harsh. At some point when you rely on yourself, you can do nothing. And I sometimes fear, especially in the Western church, we are leaning too much on our own might. Do you know that the average American over the age of two consumes about five hours and 30 minutes of media every single day? Television, tablets, phones, cable TV, Netflix, 
Korean drama, pause for conviction. That means that the average American over a 65-year lifespan will spend about nine and a half years being glued and consuming all forms of media. That is intense. And I'm not suggesting that all media is bad, but I am suggesting that there are times that they divert our attention, our affection, our adoration away from the gospel of Christ. Here's the fourth thing that we can learn from this passage, and it's the word emotions. I'm not knocking emotions. I'm not suggesting that emotions or feelings are bad. Please don't go on Twitter and blast me. My wife is a marriage and family therapist. Don't look at her in the eyes tomorrow. She'll make you cry. And so she'll always push back and says, Eugene, I think you ought to be careful how you speak about this. And I, I tell her, I said, listen, I know that our emotions matter. God created us with emotions. We ought to listen to our emotions. But what I am suggesting is that in our world today, I truly do believe that emotions have surfaced and risen to the cream of the crop where not only do we listen to our emotions, but it feels as if we worship our emotions. That our emotions are the guiding impetus to everything that we do. Listen, they matter. We ought to pay attention to them. We ought to be mindful of them, but we ought never to be enslaved by our emotions. Here's why I bring this up. In the last seven, eight years as a pastor, I've been a local church pastor for about 30 years. In the last seven or eight years, I began to notice and hear more than ever before this phrase. I don't feel like it. I don't feel God. I don't feel like working. I don't feel like staying in this marriage. I don't feel like serving. I don't feel like giving. I don't feel like forgiving. I don't feel like being generous. I don't feel and insert whatever phrase. And again, I think as leaders, we want to leave room and space to give people the opportunity to share how they're feeling. But if their feelings is the end of that conversation, then not only are we called to be ministers of hope, we're also called to be ministers who call people into faithfulness and discipleship. One of the most challenging books is written by Mother Teresa. And there's a conundrum about this book because Mother Teresa, when she passed away, uh, there was a group of people that decided to publish uh, the unauthorized autobiography of Mother Teresa. They published her journals, which I don't know about you, but that was, made me feel a little uneasy. Not enough for me to buy a book and read it. But as I was reading Mother Teresa's journal, I wanted to read it because she's one of my heroes. And in my mind, if there's like anyone that's intimate with God, the triune God, Mother Teresa's got to be up there. I mean, it's Mother Teresa. I'm reading her book. Wow, it was disturbing. It was so disturbing. I couldn't sleep. You know why it was disturbing? She details in her journal... how for not just one occasion or a couple times or weeks, but she would go months not feeling God. I don't know how that sits with you. 
but that really upset me. But in her journal, she says she kept showing up because she knew that Jesus was alive. I don't know. This is like straight candid talk, which is why I told the committee, hey, probably not good to like leave this video up on YouTube for too long. But let's just be serious. Like if you feel God's intimacy every single time, every single day, God bless you. But man... I don't. Remove this from YouTube. But I truly believe that Jesus is alive. And I truly believe that even when we're not feeling it, we're called to be faithful. Friends, last thing, and I know we're probably heading to a little break. It's the last thing that we'll share here, and I want you to hear this phrase. The last thing, if you're taking mental notes, this is one of my favorite phrases in the Bible. Come and have breakfast. coming straight from John 21. When I imagine the story, you know how the story unfolds because we read it. They eventually know that it's the voice of Jesus. They begin to glean and they're thrilled and they jump into the waters, they're pulling the net in. But I wonder to myself if Jesus were like you and me. What if Jesus didn't respond with what I consider to be one of the most beautiful stories of God's grace? What if Jesus, knowing that Peter had another existential angst moment and decided to quit? Like Jesus, who knows that Peter denied him three times. Jesus, who knows that Peter again lost control over his emotions and goes to violent ways to chop off someone's ear. What if Jesus responded with um, the silent treatment? I don't know if any parents here employ the silent treatment. It's deadly. Like seriously, what if, what if Jesus just looked at Peter and said, Mm-mm. What if Jesus responded with the one word response, the one word treatment? What if Jesus said, Really? Again? Seriously? Bro. No, but what if it was actually very serious? I'm being very, very candid here. What if Jesus responded in ways that we as humans sometimes do with one another when we're upset? What if Jesus said, Peter! I can't use you. You're unreliable, undependable. You're a loser. What if Jesus said, my destiny over your life, my grace over your life, no longer. You're absolutely dead to me. And 
I'm so grateful that Jesus isn't like that. In fact, as I'm visualizing this story, I can just imagine Jesus doing this. Then he points to the food. And then he says, again, what I truly believe to be one of the most beautiful phrases of God's grace. Come and have breakfast. See, this is the reason why I hope, even through an imperfect, broken servant as this one speaker tonight, I hope that tonight and this week, and in essence, throughout your leadership, you're taking time to feed from God's goodness. Because friends, it is challenging times for leadership and we cannot do it on our own strength come and have breakfast now we'll talk more about this in the coming nights this is not just a feel-good fuzzy breakfast story he wants to nourish us because he wants to remind us of the call of ministry on our lives we have work to do. We have leadership to engage. We have disciples to disciple. We have sermons that we must preach with authority depending on God's grace because people need to hear the gospel. But we cannot do it alone. So God, thank you again for this night as we take a moment to pause and reconvene later, but we ask again that you would be with my sisters and brothers and with me. God, we are tired, we might be weary, we might be burdened and heavy laden, but we are so grateful that you specifically call us to come unto you. Equip us with your grace, help us to eat of your goodness so that we might be charged to be faithful as we move onward in leadership and ministry. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My friends, if you could just bow your heads for a moment, if you could open your hands as I give the benediction, and if I may, uh, as a pastor at my church, we would um, often sing the benediction, so let me sing a blessing unto us. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord shine His face upon you and give you peace and give you peace forever. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Any instructions that I should be giving to people? Let's eat. Let's eat, and then they'll call you back for Q&A. Thank you.